Hello, everyone, um, and thank you um, for inviting me to speak in this symposium. So I want to talk a bit about my work um, I did in the Terkelsen lab at Cornell, talking about the genomics of temperature sensitive phenotypes and how they can differ and might be affected by climate change. So basically, lots of you have probably heard about like temperature dependent sex determination, mostly, for example, in reptiles like turtles. Um, where, for example, the sand temperature determines if an individual become male or female. Um, but recent studies have shown that, for example, climate change can lead to skewed sex ratios, for example, with increasing temperatures leading, for example, or decreasing temperatures leading to, um, for example, higher proportions of females in populations, driving them to basically being all female populations. This has been reported in recent study in turtles, but also in some fish. So um, a bit of like about sex determination. So basically the, the two extremes are when we have genetic sex determination, for example, XY chromosomes um, as we have in humans, but then also the other is then the temperature dependent sex determination where we have a like hierarchical like regulatory system that's affected by temperature. And then for example, it, um, Low temperatures leads to female development and at high temperatures to male development. Um, interestingly, while preparing this talk, my 15 month old just pulled out a random card from a stack of postcards about women and science. And I've learned actually that genetic sex determination was by sex chromosomes was first described by Nettie Stevens in 1905, but she never got the recognition for it that she deserved. So, however, sex determination is not always black and white. And there are some systems um, where we actually have everything in between. We don't have pure sex determination based on genetics or not or pure temperature dependent sex determination, but rather a gradient in between, for example, with low latitude populations being mostly temperature sensitive and high latitude populations being not. And one of these cases, like the only real extreme case I know, are the Atlantic silver sites. And Atlantic silver sites are small estuarine species that lives in shallow waters. We can catch them during spawning time in the, uh, like right at the beach. And they're widely distributed along the Atlantic coast, all the way from Northern Florida to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So ultimately they're experiencing a steep temperature climb. Some people say the steepest temperature climb on earth um, with some mean sea surface temperatures about like nearly 25 degrees in like Northern Florida to about five degrees mean temperatures in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And to basically uh, this determines to some extent due to influencing the growing season, the level of temperature dependent sex determination. So if you live in like an environment with stable temperature um, environments and long growing seasons, the populations are more likely to be temperature sensitive in that sex determination whereas northern populations in less stable uh, climates with, for example, um, short growing seasons, about like only three months, they are mostly genetically determined. And the reason behind this is that um, there are different adaptive factors playing in. For example, in southern populations, um, the early spawning batches, the early hatching batches, will be mostly females because temperature plays a large role and temperatures are quite cold, uh, colder earlier in the year. And they have a longer time to grow until the next spring where they're spawning. This is an annual species. Whereas on the other hand, the later spawning batches will be mostly males. They grow long enough, large enough by the next season to just spawn and temperature doesn't matter too much in size. Um, so basically the larger females have a higher fecundity. However, in the north, selection is, for, um, is rather important more for, um, for survival. Um, and those populations are mostly genetically determined because both sexes have to hatch at the same time, grow to a decent size by the winter to survive the harsh winters in the northern climates, and then uh, to, to be able to spawn. So there's kind of the, a potential for sexual um, antagonistic selection, sexual conflicts, like survival versus fecundity in the different sexes. Um, so we went out to use this system to kind of understand what is the genetic basis underlying this variation in the temperature sensitive phenotype? So we went out, collected 12 populations along this range of spawning sites and genotyped them 
for about uh, 8 million snaps using a low coverage whole genome sequencing approach. And what you can see is that despite the, the lack of geographic boundaries, we see strong ge um, population structuring with like from the southern populations in red to the more northern ones in blue, isolation by distance based on this like data dataset. But in particular, we find that those populations in Nova Scotia and the um, Gulf of St. Lawrence show a distinct genomic background. Um, and I will come back to this later um, uh, about the thing. So we basically went out and wanted to know which genomic regions determine the level of temperature dependent sex determination. So we performed the GWAS using a subset of individuals. And in this Manhattan plot here of about 24 chromosomes, we can see that one that many regions are, show association with the level of temperature dependent sex determination. But in particular, one region on chromosome 11, which um, we know is a large scale inversion, which is clinal. So it differs in the frequency from south to north. Um, so this region shows a strong association with the level of temperature de dependent sex determination, but also so do other regions along the genome, for example, chromosome 17 or 21. So if we look more closely at this region and we look at the frequency of this inversion in populations, and we used a principal component approach um, as a proxy for the um, inversion frequency, we can see that populations in the south, which is like most likely ancestral karyotype, um, that don't have the inversion, show higher levels of TSD, and that uh, the level of TSD decreases with increasing uh, inversion frequency towards the northern karyotype, which is basically homozygous for the inversion. And however, a problem with many of um, GWAS approaches is particular in populations where we have like strong population structure or isolation by distance is that the uh, um, associations are inflated by population structure. And it's really difficult to co fully correct for this. So we actually made um, use of this population structure to better understand uh, which regions are really um, involved and validate those regions. So we focused on populations that showed low levels um, of temperature dependent sex determination for example, one here, uh, MDME, which is in the Gulf of Maine, um, and has shows the lowest level of temperature-dependent sex determination. And we calculated statistics called delta FST, which is quite simple. It's just the FST between this population with low TSD and the neighboring population with higher TSD, and uh, subtracting the background divergence between two neighboring populations with high levels of TSD. So basically corrects some of the background divergence, and we can see that many of the regions that were initially associated also with, um, with temperature dependent sex determination in the GWAS also showed strong differentiation, including the region on chromosome 11. And the gray bars you can see here in this Manhattan plot basically show the windows that are also differentiated in the population from the east coast of Nova Scotia, um, Halifax, which is, if you remember, the distinct genomic cluster, um, but also shows low levels of TSD. So this is suggesting that even though the genomic background differs, some regions are consistently differentiated between high and low TSD populations. Um, so overall, there seems to be a correlation, but we were interested, and in, which is important for um, future models, is how this is looked like on the individual level. So we went in and um, scored for every individual um, if it's matched or mismatched between genetic, genetic and phenotypic sex. So if we have temperature dependent sex determination, we expect that in those individuals and which all of them have a genetic uh, sex locus, um, but if temperatures, for example, are low, for genetic males might, might become females. Whereas when temperatures are high, Genetic females, for example, could become males. Um, so we looked at the phenotype, and this we, um, is the sex concordance between phenotypic and genetic sex. We scored this, and then looked how this changes with the increase of um, inversion frequency. And interestingly, what we see is that in females, there doesn't see, there's not a strong effect, actually, of the inversion. But in males, we see that um, the lack of the inversion, basically, which is here in the bottom left, they have 
a relatively high pro um, probability of mismatch between phenotypic and genetic sex, about 75%. But this decreases by 35% in males with the increasing um, inversion frequency. So this inversion seems to somehow modulate um, the temperature sensitivity of sex determination. However, we don't know the mechanism yet. Um, so overall, there seems to be the inversion has a strong effect and interacts with the sex determining locus potentially by an unknown mechanisms. Um, and to bring this back to the climate aspect, so basically, using a gradient forest approach, we identified several environmental variables, most of them temperature related, that um, explain the variation in the adaptive loci. So taking all of those together, the inversion, but also other regions outside the inversion. And uh, basically confirming what we know from the phenotypic data, the length of breeding season and mean temperature per important roles. If we look at climate models, the most extremes, uh, for example, or the least and the strongest climate model, um, we can see that the strongest temperature changes will occur in the northern populations up to two degrees, um, which one then can say that there might be more genomically vulnerable. However, those populations are also least sensitive to differences in temperatures because they're mostly genetically determined. So this is uh, an important point to consider as well uh, when one wants to predict basically how populations respond to climates. So overall, we have all the puzzle pieces from variation in the phenotype to temperature data, climate models, demographic estimates, not only the PCA, but also additional estimates and the genomic architecture, which we can put together to model the effect of climate change on variation and sex determination using this unusual system kind of as a base, which can then be expanded hopefully to other species. And with this, I want to end and thank my team at, at the Turkelson Lab, my collaborators, um, our funding body, the NSF, and also use the opportunity to pitch two postdoc opportunities that are rising in the Turkelson Lab, one to work in clinal variation in American chat, and want to actually replace my position since I will be starting my own independent research as a research fellow um, at the University of Glasgow to work on lampreys. So if you want to work with an amazing supervisor, email Nina or look on Evil Deer or um, Job Archive. And with this, I want to thank the organizers for this amazing symposium and inviting such great speakers and all um, the funders for the symposium. Thank you.